Hi, welcome to the Nitric Week presentation. My name is Dave Kennedy, part of the Nitric development team, and I'll be speaking on the NIH data management and sharing policy and how Nitric can help. By way of overview, I will spend a little bit of time talking about the history of Nitric and also the things that have evolved over the same sort of time period. Uh, we'll then introduce uh, the, some of the specifics of the new NIH data sharing mandate and talk about ways Nitric and the community can help individual researchers solve the needs of the mandate. By way of very brief history, Nitric was originally launched in 2007 uh, through funding by the NIH Blueprint for Neuroscience Research. Its initial scope was fairly limited to create a clearinghouse of software tools for MRI research. Over the years, Nitric and the community have grown. Our scope has expanded in terms of acquisition methodologies to include MR, yes, but also PET, SPECT, CT, EEG, MEG, optical imaging, clinical neuroimaging, and computational neuroscience and imaging genomics types of efforts. And in addition to a listing of software tools, we also, yes, list tools, but we also list and host data and provide uh, advanced computational resources to the community. During the similar time period, a lot of things have changed. On the negative side, this concern about reproducibility and credibility in science in general and neuroscience in particular has emerged. The underpinnings of this have been percolating since, you know, 2005 or so, where Jan Ioannidis published a revolutionary essay uh, discussing why most published research findings are false. This was just the beginning of a long series of discussions and essays and debate about sort of the underlying statistical principles that, that underlie research you know, as a whole. Uh, other tips of the iceberg moment include uh, 2012, where Tom Insel and team at the National Institutes of Mental Health began to lament the slowness of progress you know, in developing you know, true biomarkers and interventions for psychiatric uh, conditions. Uh, and you know, despite you know, lots of funding being dedicated to research, not that many replicable and uh, actionable findings were emerging from the literature. Uh, and another kind of hallmark the uh, earthquake you know, paper was in 2016, the so-called cluster failure paper, uh, a paper that elucidates you know, uh, some issues with fMRI inference uh, in the spatial extent of uh, the activated regions, calling into question a lot of the details of uh, some of the inner workings of the tools that were being used you know, day in and day out. This is by no means a uh, comprehensive listing of the crisis and credibility types of issues that were coming up over this era, but it's just a pointer to a number of the things in that sort of groundswell of, of uh, uh, concern about reproducibility and credibility. Now, of course, when the scientific literature begins to get a sense of uh, reproducibility issues, that can get magnified into the popular press in terms of credibility and suddenly, you know, the, the Economist and the Los Angeles Times and lots of, you know, more lay and popular press begin to get a hold of this and uh, create, you know, a good bit of havoc in the community. But what exactly is going on and how trustworthy and credible the research enterprise is. Throughout today's presentation, I'm going to try to uh, guide you to additional resources to learning more about various topics. So here's the first example of that. Want to more, learn more about the reproducibility problem? Well, in a lovely series of lectures, uh, there's no one better than Russ Poldrack uh, to you know, give full discussions of this topic. So in the slides and the links that are available with this presentation, uh, I point out, you know, for example, the Neuro Academy 2023 uh, lecture by Russ Poldrack in terms of reproducibility and fMRI and what is the problem. It's a great watch. Russ does a great job with that. And so I encourage you know, folks who want to dig deeper into this topic you know, to go to that resource. Back to our 
evolutionary topics of things that have been changing, you know, in the metric era. Uh, I highlight, you know, just a smattering of things in this slide, uh, and I color code them by sort of different topical areas. We'll see some things highlighted in yellow, which have to do with funding agency mandates and, and events, you know, that have occurred. Highlights of this uh, include that, you know, even since 2003, the NIH has been embedding data sharing uh, requirements or recommendations um, uh, along the way. Now the 2003 policy required data sharing plans uh, for applications that exceeded $500,000. So that was really kind of a limited piece of the NIH portfolio. But yet there was you know, the mandate and the, uh, the history, the precedence for having you know, data sharing being part of the uh, NIH funding policy. Things we see highlighted in green here come from the types of things that the journals, our publishers, you know, are uh, you know, invoking in terms of uh, reproducibility and credibility and trying to enhance the, the in information being published uh, sort of on the publication end of things. So we'll see things like, you know, in 2004, with the inception of the journal uh, Neuroinformatics, that, you know, requirements to disclose how the information of an article, the data, the software, uh, et cetera, were being shared, was being required to be disclosed. Uh, and in 2011, the uh, journal Neuroinformatics introduced, you know, data publications. Probably not the first data publication article type, but it was a, a hallmark you know, moment in trying to make data you know, a more prominent part of the publication landscape. Then we also see highlighted in light blue some of the centers and infrastructure that's being you know, developed and supported to try to help you know, the community. So we see things in you know, 2012 and 13, the uh, opening of you know, efforts such as the Open Science Framework and the Center for Open Science and things like that. So we see a lot of things, you know, happening here. The uh, uh, funders are beginning to uh, up the, um, uh, the requirements for data sharing. Uh, the journals and publishers are, you know, beginning to up their requirements in terms of, you know, requiring shared data and shared resources to be disclosed in the publications. Uh, and the development of infrastructures and resources and centers, you know, designed to help the community solve these types of issues you know, is also beginning to, to emerge. The plethora of things I just uh, showed in that prior uh, slide was really a little bit chaotic, you know, though. So, you know, funders were doing things, publishers were doing things, centers and ideas were emerging into the field. Um, but uh, in order to bring a little um, uh, principled approach to these types of things, uh, many researchers got together and tried to come up with various principles you know, to guide you know, this uh, burgeoning you know, community. And the two I want to point out here, uh, the first of which is the trust principles, which we stand for transparency, reusability, user focus, sustainability, and technology uh, is a framework to facilitate discussion and implementation of the best practices in digital preservation for all stakeholders. So trust uh, emerged in uh, 20, uh, 20 or so, uh, and you know, really a hallmark principled concept uh, that you hear an awful lot about now is fair, findable, uh, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. These fair guiding principles emerged in 2016 or so, uh, and have really become a hallmark uh, of the different initiatives and missions from the funders, from the publishers, and from the data science uh, community. Want to learn more about FAIR data and the FAIR principles? There's no one better than Marianne Martone to uh, provide detailed and comprehensive and you know, high quality presentations of these topics. She was part of the origination of the FAIR principles uh, and lectures pointed to in these slides at the ABCD Reprenum course or Neurohack. Academy uh, provide excellent resources to learn more about FAIR data. So that previous trip down a brief historical memory lane really was designed to set us up to discussing of the NIH data management and sharing plan, uh, a new policy, much more um, uh, 
comprehensive uh, that has become effective uh, since January 25th of 2023. Uh, because of the uh, crisis in uh, reproducibility and credibility that emerged, and the presence of resources to combat this, uh, the NIH you know, has you know, decided to put its um, uh, money you know, where its mouth is and to try to uh, you know, require uh, funded research projects you know, to do a better job of embracing better data management and data sharing policies in order to you know, lessen you know, the crisis and you know, make more significant and you know, effective you know, progress in the different area, areas of research. Under this uh, policy, the NIH expects their investigators to plan and budget for the managing and sharing of data. Now, to some extent, everyone has been doing this, but this is now a more you know, dedicated uh, focus you know, of you know, making this an important element of the you know, granting uh, process. And so this reminds us that you know, the money exists. It's not necessarily new money, but uh, the money that a, a researcher gets to do research you know, should be you know, being used in part to budget for the management and sharing of that data. It's not an afterthought, it's part of the process itself. Uh, now more comprehensive plans are required to be submitted uh, for programmatic review whenever you apply for funding. Uh, and you know, equally important, you know, there's some teeth to this policy in the sense that uh, not only do you have to uh, propose a data management and sharing plan, but also there will be more uh, oversight and uh, checking you know, for compliance with uh, approved plans to make sure that uh, you know, investigators carry through with the plans that they uh, propose and the plans that they get funding for. The types of elements in the policy that we'll go through in a minute really uh, you know, provides guidance and uh, a really good roadmap to be you know, explicit about questions such as you know, what data will be shared, when will it be available, how will it be accessed by and by who you know, will be able to access, you know, access you know, that data. So without further ado, let's get into the six elements of uh, factors that the data management and sharing plan require investigators to address. Element one has to do with data type. Uh, wants uh, the investigators to enumerate the types and amount of data that are expected, uh, to discuss you know, which of these will be preserved and shared uh, and why, uh, and to uh, provide reminders that you know, data also requires metadata and other relevant uh, data to be associated with it, as well as documentation, so that the data that is shared is most usable to the community. Element two addresses the related tools and software necessary to access data. Again, trying to be sure that uh, data that is shared uh, also is shared in a way that the user community has the ability to use, utilize you know, that data. So we're going to dig a little bit more into the type and metadata topic in the next slide. So data type. Uh, you know, really wants to make sure that uh, investigators disclose all of the data that will be uh, included in our neuroimaging community. That can be, you know, including but not limited to the various imaging assessments that are done, behavioral assessments, clinical assessments, demographics, video recordings, health records, etc. cetera. Uh, investigators are encouraged, required to consider everything that is being generated by the research project that is a data type, if that influences the conclusions and publications that will emerge from this uh, work, then it needs to be considered and disclosed. Uh, metadata is required. Uh, what is metadata? Metadata is data about the data. It's everything you need to know in order to make the actual data itself useful and self-describing. So in a sort of typical uh, neuroimaging type of experiment, you know, an MRI scan is a fine data type, but an MRI scan by itself is not truly useful unless you know lots of information, lots of metadata about that uh, uh, data type. You know, what is the uh, acquisition type? What is the resolution? What's the subject you know, characteristics, etc.? So the metadata is necessary in order to make the data useful. And so these become two key uh, requirements of this element one of the data sharing plan. 
want to learn more about metadata and the associated semantic markup that uh, metadata helps enable in order to uh, understand data better, well, I recommend the uh, ABCD Repernim uh, lecture by David Keeter on metadata and semantic markup. Element three of the data management and sharing plan addresses standards. Uh, standards are critical because again, people who use the data you share have to be able to access it and use it. And use of standards uh, really lowers the barriers to how you know, people and tools you know, can access you know, data. Element four talks a lot about the when and who you know, can access your data. Uh, it talks about selecting of a repository, uh, about how the data within that repository will be identified and findable, uh, and when and how long that scientific data will be made available are critical elements of element four. Let's look at a couple of these a little bit more closely. Uh, standards, as we said, are you know, critical to making data usable. Uh, the neuroimaging community is very fortunate to have many standards for its different uh, elements of, of data acquisition, uh, ranging from the scanners, you know, acquiring DICOM data, uh, the tools often using the NIFTY data sets uh, as a representation of that DICOM uh, imaging data, and the BIDS, the Brain Imaging Data Standard, that uh, helps uh, organize you know, data into useful ways. And so to not only be neuroimaging, uh, MRI-centric. I also uh, mentioned the standards here for electrophysiology data, the NeuroData Without Borders uh, link here, to name a few. Um, the community you know, is encouraged to use standards where available, but however, standards may not yet be available for everything. So the ability of the community to create standards and best practices you know, also needs to be supported. And so that's why the uh, functionalities of the uh, international Neuroinformatics Coordinating Facility are quite important to giving a international opportunity to create standards and vet standards and uh, uh, you know, promote you know, the development of the appropriate standards. When it comes to talking about Element 4 data preservation, uh, it's important to note that the neuroimaging community, again, is fortunate to have many repositories. Uh, many of the existing repositories can be discovered at NITRIC, uh, as well as the listings that the NIH you know, hosts themselves and at resources such as fair sharing. Uh, repository selection, you know, how you pick a, select, uh, a repository can depend on many factors. Uh, sometimes the funding agency influences what uh, uh, resource you might use. Sometimes the data restrictions influence what resource you might use. Uh, sometimes the data type influences that. But when you have specialist data, you know, like MRI, uh, like, uh, you know, different special, you know, topics, there can be, you know, repositories that are specialized to those topical areas. Um, often, if you have uh, data that doesn't fit into a specialist repository, then there are generalist repositories available, things like Dryad, Figshare, uh, Mendeley Data, Zenodo, etc. cetera. A couple of principles you know, to keep uh, in mind are you know, to make your data as open as possible, uh, to make it uh, as accessible as possible, but to also make it as restricted as necessary in order to uh, protect you know, the ethical and uh, identity you know, features uh, of, the, of the populations. Another feature to keep in mind is uh, considering to choose you know, repositories that are you know, established and well vetted, uh, particularly ones that uh, follow uh, principles such as the nine best practices for research software registries and repositories. Uh, this helps you know, give you a surety that the resources and registries are you know, participating in sort of best practice types of, of ways. Continuing our walk through the policy, we see element five, which addresses uh, access, distribution, and reuse consideration. Ultimately, this is the topic of data governance. Uh, the policy you know, requires investigators to be explicit about you know, how uh, and who you know, can access the data and you know, under what terms you know, data can be reused. Uh, and so the elements of you know, control and protections for privacy uh, of human research you know, participants you know, is part of this element. Uh, and finally, uh, data you know, 
needs to be released in ways that you know, are overseen and managed uh, appropriately. So uh, again, explicit descriptions of how that will occur and need to uh, be presented as part of the plan. Want to learn more about data governance? Uh, highly recommend a series of, of lectures by Damien Eka uh, in the Neuro Academy uh, set of, of lectures that really go into responsible data governance and uh, getting the compliance you know, factor into the FAIR policies. Of course, whenever we talk about data sharing and ethics, we need to make sure that we first uh, paid attention to the consent process with our human subject participants. Uh, consent is a challenging and uh, rich topic. Uh, I encourage uh, and forward you to the Open Brain Consent uh, Initiative to learn more about consent and ways of uh, invoking consent in ways that are most uh, supportive of the uh, underlying mission to be able to share research data. Now that we've had our high-level review of the elements of a, the data sharing and management plans, let's talk about the resources that are available to the community to help uh, create such uh, plans uh, going forward. And one of the ways Nitric can help is to provide a clearinghouse of the tools and community and discussion that uh, underlies a proper data management plan uh, creation. To this end, Nitric uh, is in the process of creating a data management and sharing uh, project page at Nitric that will you know, sort of play this clearinghouse role of pointing you know, investigators to the resources and to the discussions and provide a forum for, for conversation and, and, and work together. So I uh, encourage you to follow the link you know, in this presentation uh, and uh, play along as that uh, resource you know, gets uh, created. The NIH itself makes a number of videos and uh, instructions available about uh, the policy and its intent and you know, the expectations for, for planning uh, and success in that area. So we encourage you know, folks to, to take advantage of that as well. A valuable resource uh, that's also already you know, out there from the California Digital Library is called the DMP tool uh, that helps uh, users create data management plans uh, and is aware of the requirements of different uh, uh, plan types uh, can help walk users through that. So these are just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, this is a coming attractions uh, uh, promotion to uh, help the community you know, aggregate these informations, collect them into a centralized place so that individuals can meet the requirements more efficiently uh, through clearing houses such as the Nitric page. With that, I'd like to thank you for listening to uh, this little presentation on the data management plan and how Nitric can help uh, and acknowledge our funders and our Nitric development team and the various resources that you know, we build upon. Uh, thank you again for listening and I hope you have a great Nitric week.